Well, it really is a privilege to be here this morning, and I'm very excited to introduce our, our first major speaker, the Honorable David Walker, who served as Comptroller General of the United States and then for 10 years ran the Government Accountability Office, known as the government's watchdog. He once described his job at GAO as virtually everything the government is doing or thinking of doing anywhere in the world. And when he was leaving the post about five years ago, I interviewed him for NPR, and I asked him, was there any one moment you can recall that you looked at a report GAO was about to release and thought to yourself, my god, I cannot believe our government actually did this. And he replied, I can't narrow it down to one. <laughs> Please welcome David Walker. Thank you, Ari, very much. Uh, it's truly a pleasure and an honor to be here, and a real tribute to Senator Rudman with the turnout that we had last evening and then here again today, uh, including this front row, which is the front line of fiscal responsibility uh, here, if, if I can say. And it, I've had the good fortune of coming to New Hampshire a number of times, not necessarily for political campaigns, the state of live, freeze, and die. <laughs> And, and last evening, I, we heard Senator McCain make a few comments about the Logan Airport and about Senator Mitchell and, and Senator Rudman. And Senator Rudman was trying to give directions to Senator Mitchell. I know why that is the case. And the reason being is that Bob Carey and Susan Tanaka and I rented a car, fiscal responsibility, all went in the same car. And we were trying to get out of the parking garage at the Manchester Airport and I've got to tell you, there's no directions whatsoever. And GPS doesn't work in the garage at the Manchester Airport. Then we're going down the road, and I know that New Hampshire does not have an income tax, so we approached a toll. So I figured that this is going to cost big money. So being from the tri-state area, New York, Connecticut, New Jersey, I pulled out all the water bills that I had in my, uh, in, in my pocket. And sure enough, I said, how much is it? She said, a dollar. And I absolutely couldn't believe it. And then Bob had the GPS system uh, that, for the most part, was good. But we had to do a couple of Louie Louies. For those of you who don't know what that means, that's a U-turn uh, in order to try to be able to get to where we were. So now we're here. But on a more serious note, Senator Rudman was a fighter who fought for what he thought was right his whole life. From his days as an amateur boxer, the front lines of Korea, his many government positions, including his U.S. Senator, and his subsequent life after the government, including being a founder of the Concord Coalition. He was widely admired and respected for his integrity, his leadership, and his bipartisanship on many issues. Arguably, his signature issue was the issue that we're here to discuss today, and that is fiscal responsibility. He was a principle-based leader and a problem solver who believed in constructive compromise and working for the greater good. There are three quotes that I think are symbolic of Warren Rudman. As co-chair of the Iran-Contra Committee, he said, I consider myself an American first and a Republican second. Secondly, when speaking on the grand Rudman Hollings bill, as we heard last evening from Senator McCain, he said, it was a bad idea whose time has come. And when he decided not to run for re-election to the Senate, he said that Washington had become stuck in the mud of strident partisanship, excessive ideology, and never-ending campaigns. Do those words sound familiar today? In addressing today's topic of fiscal responsibility, I'd like to start with a provocative comment and note that my family has been in this country since the 1680s, uh, but I'm a rel relative newcomer compared to my wife, whose family is related on her mother's side to Ponce de Leon and on her father's side, the second boat that came to Jamestown in 1608. This country is arguably the greatest in the history of mankind. It's truly the beacon of to the free world and the land of opportunity for many. But in my view, we've lost our way. We were founded on a number of timeless principles and values, including with regard to fiscal issues, 
that we've strayed from. First, values like limited but effective government, individual liberty and opportunity, personal responsibility and accountability, rule of law and equal justice under the law, fiscal responsibility and intergenerational equity, and a word that quite frankly we don't hear enough anymore, stewardship. Stewardship means that as a leader, whether you're in the public sector, the private sector, the not-for-profit sector, you have a responsibility not just to generate positive results today, not just to leave things better off when you leave than when you came, whether it's a job or this planet, but to leave things better positioned for the future. I hate to say it, but my generation, the baby boom generation, in my view, is not doing a God, good job with regard to stewardship. And that must change. We are violating these principles, and it's important that we change course so that we can help create a better future. Now I'd like to give you some thought-provoking comments focused on various dates in history with, with the theme of fiscal responsibility. 1789 the year that the Constitution, the greatest political document in the history of mankind, was ratified. Obviously, New Hampshire being one of the original 13 colonies and states. We defeated the most powerful military on the face of the earth to win our independence. And to gain ratification of the US Constitution, we had total debt as a percentage of the economy of 40%. And that counted state debt because in order to gain agreement of all the states, the deal was done to assume all state debt. So total federal and state debt as a percentage of GDP was 40%. Fast forward to 1835, 1836, no debt. Only time in the history of the United States, Andrew Jackson, that we've never had debt, it'll never happen again. And it doesn't need to happen again. Go to 1913. Three things happened in 1913 that fundamentally transformed the size and role of the federal government and undercut states' rights 100 years ago. The income tax, the Federal Reserve, and direct election of senators by the people rather than appointment by state legislators. In 1913, the federal government was 2% of the size of the U.S. economy, and the Congress controlled 97% of all spending. Stay tuned, you'll see what's happened since then. 1945, in the aftermath of World War II, the United States had debt, total debt to GDP of about 120%, but we were over 50% of the global economy, the dollar was as good as gold, and we had 16 people working for every person drawing on Social Security. We were it. We invested in critical infrastructure, we invested in human capital, we invested to help develop uh, the, the rest of the world, including the defeatist Axis powers, to promote free trade. We brought back fiscal responsibility and debt to GDP plummeted from 120 percent down dramatically, and we didn't pay off a dime of debt. Not a dime. Because we understood that the rule was you need to exert demonstrate fiscal discipline and promote economic growth because what, ma what matters is not whether you have debt, not whether or not you have a balanced budget, but what is debt as a percentage of your income, percent of GDP. That's the right goal. 1985 to 1987, Grand Rubin Hollings, the first version, 85, the second version, 87, after Bowser v. Sinar. The U.S. government had grown, grown from 2% of GDP in 1913 to 23% of GDP, 11 and a half times larger. The deficit was 5% of GDP and debt was 43% of GDP. That's only federal debt, but that's total. That's both Social Security and Medicare as well as public debt, 43%. In 2000, in large part because of the effect of Grand Rubman Hollings and a number of other things, in large part because of that, we went, we went from a 5% deficit to a 2.4% surplus. And it was a real surplus. We had an operating surplus excluding Social Security. And for the first time in many years, we paid down U.S. debt. And believe it or not, people were worried that we were going to pay off the national debt. Can you imagine that? 
I was Comptroller General of the United States. I didn't think for a nanosecond that we would pay off the national debt because I knew how Washington worked. And I remember testifying before the Senate Finance Committee to say, keep in mind, these are projected surpluses. They may or may not happen. In addition, because of known demographic trends and rising health care costs, we know that we're going to return to deficits and debt. We need to prepare. Be prudent. Be cautious. Unfortunately, they weren't. Uh, in 2000, debt uh, was 57 percent of GDP, and Social Security had a surplus. In 2003, we had a round of second round of tax cuts. We invaded a sovereign nation without declaring war and without paying for it, and Medicare prescription drugs was passed. To me, that was when things really started spinning out of control, 2003. In 2008 through 2010, TANF, the stimulus, the auto bailout, the Affordable Care Act, pluses and minuses, but the bottom line is government grew bigger, promised more, did not end up putting appropriate terms and conditions and as a result did not treat the disease, only treated the symptoms. And today in 2012, we're back to spending, oh in 2012, not today, we're in 2013. In 2012, the government was back to spending 23 percent of GDP. Uh, in addition to that, it only controlled 34 percent of spending. So from 1913, where we controlled 97 percent, Congress now only, only controls 34. And by the way, that 34 that's controlled and is getting squeezed, so-called defense and non-defense discretionary spending, includes all of the express and enumerated responsibilities envisioned by our nation's founders under the Constitution, all investments in our future, and all investments in young people. So we're spending more and more on consumption, less and less on investment, more and more on seniors, less and less on young people, more and more on things that aren't expressed and enumerated in the Constitution, less and less on things that are. That is not a prescription for prosperity. We must change course. Government has grown too big, promised too much, and needs to restructure at all levels of government in many cases. Our current fiscal path is irresponsible. It is also unethical and immoral. We are mortgaging the future of our kids and grandchildren at record rates, reducing relevant investments in their future at a time that they're going to face a lot tougher competition and an increasingly interconnected and interdependent global marketplace. That is immoral, and it must stop. But how we change course matters, and that is where I want to transition to now. We have to recognize that our objective should not be to balance the budget because the way that the government calculates a balanced budget is a bad joke. It is a bad joke. Our, our objective should not be to pay off the national debt. We don't have to pay off the national debt, and we're not going to. But we must get debt as a percentage of the economy, and for, pub, for purposes here I'm talking about public debt to GDP, down to a reasonable and sustainable level within the next 10 to 15 years, and be on a path to keep it there given known demographic trends and rising health care costs. And pardon my language, but baselines are BS. They can be manipulated. They are 10-year flat earth theory. We need to get rid of them. And we need to focus like a laser on what really matters, and that is debt as a percentage of GDP. Uh, secondly, we have huge interest rate risk. The fastest growing expense in the projected federal budget program, programmatically, pardon me, is health care, but the fastest growing expense percentage-wise is interest. We are self-dealing in our own debt. The Federal Reserve is the only player that has appetite for our long-term debt. We don't know what real interest rates are. We have the lowest average maturity of any major sovereign nation. We have historically low interest rates, and for every 1% increase in interest rates, it's $167 billion in interest, for which, as we say in the South, you get Shinola, nothing, absolutely nothing. And, and even with a reasonable increase in interest rates as projected under President Obama's budget, we're going to be paying $800 billion plus for interest in 10 years, for which we'll get nothing. That is not an acceptable path.
We are treating the symptoms rather than the disease. With regard to the fiscal cliff, we raise taxes on the wealthy. Anybody here that believes that we're going to solve our problem only dealing with people making over $400,000 a year would flunk math. The numbers don't come close to working. At the same point in time, our problem is primarily a spending problem, a primarily projected spending problem, especially with regard to mandatory spending, especially with regard to health care. And yet if we look what happened with regard to the fiscal cliff, what did we do? We cut defense and non-defense discretionary spending in an across-the-board meat acts mindless way. Yes, we need to cut defense and non-defense discretionary spending, but in an intelligent manner. And we need to start treating the drivers of our structural deficits, which are social insurance programs. And I don't use the word entitlement because they're not entitlements. Under the U.S. Constitution, there's only two things that are guaranteed, bondholders of U.S. debt and union Civil War pensions. And I think we paid those. <laughs> now, I was born in Alabama. For some reason, they didn't guarantee our pensions. But I think I know why. I'm not sure. Uh, in any event, so you know, we have to recognize that we've got to deal with social insurance programs, health care costs, and an outdated, inadequate, and uncompetitive tax system. Those are the keys for moving forward, as well as tough budget controls uh, that have to be in place. So in summary, we're in tough shape, but it is not hopeless. And let me tell you why. Because the people are ahead of the politicians. I have been to all 50 states. Recently, I went on a 10,000-mile national fiscal responsibility bus tour that started in New Hampshire, went as far west as Nevada went all the way down to Florida and ended up in Washington, D.C. And what did we find? Number one, the people are a lot smarter than many people realize. Number two, they know we're in trouble. They know you can't spend a trillion dollars more than you take in, charge the credit card, self-deal in your own debt, and not expect, not expect a day of reckoning. In addition to that, they, they're willing to accept tough choices with regard to social insurance program reforms, taxes, and other changes as long as they're part of a comprehensive plan that they deem to be fair. And uh, we also found, and Alice Ribbon was with me uh, in one of the uh, representative town hall meetings in Northern Virginia. We had another one in representative town hall meeting in, in Northern Ohio. These were representative groups of voters demographically who were told the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth. And once they understood that, they were willing to make tough choices. They agreed 92% on six principles to, to, to guide a grand bargain. We need to pro-growth policies that are socially equitable, culturally acceptable, that pass a math test and, and reasonable test on getting debt to GDP down. It's got to be politically feasible, and you've got to get meaningful bipartisan support. I won't go into the details about that. Those are the six principles. We got 92% support. We then expose them to a range of reforms dealing with budget controls. It's got to be fundamental reform to our budget process. It's an abomination. Dealing with Social Security, Medicare and Medicaid, health care, taxes, defense, and government reforms and political reforms. We got a minimum of 77% support for a range of illustrative reforms up to 90%. What's the problem? 92% agreement on principles, 77 to 90% on specific reforms, 97% said it should be a top priority for the President and the Congress after hearing the truth, the whole truth and nothing but the truth. The problem, the biggest deficit this country has is a leadership deficit. And it's bigger with Warren Rubman's passing. But we can, we must. And I hope that we will rise to meet this challenge and hopefully in 2013. And how do we do it? Number one, presidential leadership. There's only one person elected by all the people, President of the United States, the Chief Executive Officer. Secondly, by going to the people and doing what Alice and I did in several locations around the country with representative groups of citizens, with the President or the Vice President, and bipartisan leaders from the Senate and the House, to actually go and observe and listen to what the American people think and respond to what they say, to hear and to heed, and to recognize that we need a comprehensive reform 
that will reform social insurance programs, deal with health care costs, and generate more revenues. The Republicans don't want to raise taxes. They're going to have to go up. But they need to be done as comprehensive tax reform. The Democrats don't want to renegotiate the social insurance contract. It is absolutely imperative. The only way you're going to get it done is to couple them. You have to couple them in order to get it done, and that's where the American people are. In summary, we're a great nation. But if we want to stay great, we've got to recognize reality. We've got to make tough choices. We need to do it sooner rather than later. Let's do it for our country. Let's do it for Warren Rutherford. Thank you very much.